Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, welcome all to this uh, the uh, tenth meeting of uh, uh, concepts, actions, and objects. Uh, it's a special year. It's the tenth anniversary. Um, I'm not going to take much time. Just allow me two minutes, just to. Uh, say that this is a very emotional moment. I mean, when we, a uh, small group of us at first, uh, Mel, Alex, and Brad, and I thought of having this meeting, we thought we would do it once, perhaps twice. But after the first meeting, uh, everyone was so excited that they said, let's do it again. And of course, we were lucky that uh, we had a young person with us, Brad. Um, who was willing to assume much of the responsibility. Uh, but as, uh, as the group uh, became more success successful, um, uh, we were joined by two other illustrious scientists um, who are now members also of the uh, uh, planning committee, uh, Sharon and Marius. And again, uh, we're lucky to have um, a very able younger colleague who uh, has larger shoulders than us, uh, all the ones uh, to carry most of the responsibility. Um, so we are all very grateful uh, to, to, to you all for organizing the, this event and making it success. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the University of Trent, of course, and CHIMEC in particular, for um, making this possible through their financial support, uh, including the uh, Fundazione Caritro, uh, which over the years has been very supportive. Uh, so the success uh, of these events owe much to these people, uh, but you all know, of course, that the real uh, contributors to the event are the participants. Uh, first, the speakers, and uh, of course, the audience. One of the interesting things about this event, um, and there are many others like this, I guess, but, but I think we were one of the better practitioners of this approach, is that talks tend to be not very long, 45 minutes, uh, and then we have half an hour for discussion. And the discussion is usually quite animated uh, and it's usually uh, very, uh, um, very exciting. I think that's when some of the most interesting ideas come out, uh, when we may be off guard and have to answer a difficult question we hadn't thought of. Uh, so uh, we have a full program, and uh, later after the break, perhaps we'll say more about, about events. Um, but I, since we're later, we'd like to start uh, with uh, 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 the speakers today. We have a, we have a great, uh, uh, great, a uh, fantastic, some would say, uh, collection of speakers um, today, in particular, um, uh, and uh, and it gets better as the day goes forward. Um, uh, but written or really, that we have a great uh, group. I am also pleased to be one of the speakers. Uh, we have a tradition of one of the uh, organizers being one of the speakers, and uh, it was my turn, and I'm thankful to my colleagues for allowing me to speak. Uh, so um, uh, today, uh, uh, sessions, the first uh, speaker uh, was scheduled to be Pietro uh, Pietrini, uh, who is not able to come uh, due to illness. Um, uh, but is a great uh, uh, collaborator, uh, is here, Emiliano Ricciardi, who um, I think has been, uh, uh, well, I, I shouldn't be talking about that particular collaboration, but uh, 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 Emiliano is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, to my mind, perhaps the uh, um, uh, most uh, knowledgeable uh, researcher uh, in the area of uh, uh, the study of uh, uh, the blind brain. So Emiliano, first speaker, thank you. No, no, no. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Alfonso, for, for the presentation and uh, the organizing for inviting our group to introduce uh, our lines of research. Uh, yesterday morning, as Alfonso was mentioning, when uh, uh, I received a 1 a.m. email from uh, uh, my 
main collaborator, Pietro Petrinesi, uh, former mentor and collaborator, telling that he was uh, unable to walk, so unable to come to, 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 to the Rovereto, was quite in panic. Probably you remember a scene like this when uh, on a stage uh, of the opera performance you see an un undressed backup opera singer performing, like in the Zaida, you see someone dressed in black. Now, there are several reasons why I could obviously say, uh, you know, say yes to this uh, invitation to, uh, to, to take Pietro's uh, uh, talk. One is that uh, it, it's, it's always a great honor to, to be here as a speaker uh, in, in, in one of the best workshops we have in Italy. Uh, second, you know, Pietro and I have been collaborating since I was a medical student for almost 15 years on uh, these studies on, uh, on the blind brain. And third, I already did that, you know, I already sang in the past in my previous life, and uh, it's very nice after 15 years being here with another speaker that you've seen here. <laughs> this is Michael Beauchamp playing cello. <laughs> this is something he wanted to keep secret, but uh, almost 15 years we were able to perform and rehearse together. So, uh, as an opera singer, I could not say no. So let's change the uh, title slide and just affiliation and the name and email. and. Uh, Today I would like to, uh, as I told you, introduce to our kind of theoretical and uh, experimental framework we've been developing in the last years on the uh, supermodel uh, uh, brain. Let me thank first uh, all collaborators, not only uh, Pietro Pietrini, that has been obviously my uh, first uh, uh, point of reference as, 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 from an uh, education viewpoint mainly our uh, collaborators, our fellow, that, uh, as I used to say in this last talk, uh, are those people that make our uh, dreams, our uh, theories become statistically true. So uh, thank to them. Today, in the last year, uh, our group uh, have been investigating mainly how uh, our brain does represent the external world. And in this theoretical framework, we do need to uh, imply different level of observation and uh, associate, for example, cognition to a specific cerebral correlates or respectively the cerebral correlates to uh, distinct uh, behaviors. Uh, from the tradition that Pietro, with several collaborators, and mainly Jim Axby, has been developing when he was at NIH, uh, we have been studying and investigating the role that vision plays in representing the external world. And we know that uh, vision plays a, a, pl a primary role. Uh, since the early days, the sight has always been regarded as the most important sense for humans in order to uh, knowledge uh, to, to, to acquire knowledge of the external world, to interact with the surrounding world. This is, for example, is true, you know, in the, if you think, for instance, in the ancient Greek language, the verb to know it, it was the past tense of the verb to see. That is, I saw, does, I know. Obviously, the relevance of sight is clearly reflected in the, in the mental attitude of a lexicon of vision you know, across several languages, in Italian, in English, uh, almost everywhere. And again, from a neuroanatomical perspective, there are different uh, percentage, but we know that probably uh, one third, uh, half of the, of the whole cortex is, uh, is thought to be involved in uh, sensory processing. Uh, Jim Axby and Pietro Pietrini has been uh, dealing with several aspects of uh, vision perception, organization of the uh, extra-straight pathways. I just would like to remind uh, probably their 2001 contribution on uh, this science paper. Uh, and I think that uh, their idea is uh, uh, expressed in this paper is amazing for two aspects. One, for the first time, uh, uh, they were claiming that the representation of the external world, and mainly that object shape, uh, was uh, uh, represented across uh, distributed and overlapping uh, patterns of neural response. And second, this paper could be considered the father of uh, uh, what has been a, a, an increasing flow of multivariate data analysis to brain imaging. When we go to, uh, uh, to analyze those data, uh, the, the following question was, uh, well, is, the only, is vision the only way that we have to see the surrounding world? Well, when uh, it happens ordinarily to observe a, bl a blind individual, you may uh, often find yourself to wonder whether the person is uh, truly visually deprived. 
uh, they are, blind people are proficient in every day's life activities, are able to interact with the surrounding objects and tools, uh, uh, navigate independently, interact socially with other people. So, uh, though vision offers distinctive information, there are several indications that uh, the lack of visual experience uh, may have just limited effect on the perception and on the mental representation of the surrounding world. So the idea was, uh, uh, how do individuals with congenital blindness represent a world that they've never seen? Uh, what happens to those visual devoted brain structures in the absence of sight? So I'm just showing a few examples of uh, uh, world renew artists. Uh, this is a blind photographer and this, the other uh, more renowned blind painters. And it's amazing how uh, this uh, example of, art, of, of artists that rely on a visually sensory aesthetic to create and, me, and make people appreciate what we would call a visual beauty. So the idea is really, uh, is really vision necessary to see the external world? Where the first studies on blind individuals, most of the first studies and on the first research, has classically focused on the compensation, on the compensatory plastic rearrangements that follow the, the loss of sight. The idea was to uh, understand the capability of our brain to reallocate these uh, cerebral resources that were no more used to process visual inputs. And the idea was obviously explained in the, the aspects of uh, cross-modal plasticity. Uh, I mean, brain regions that in the sight individuals responds to specifically to, 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 to visual information and that in the blind individual starts to respond specifically to the same information conveyed through a non-visual modalities. Several studies obviously have been developing and starting from the early studies from uh, Sadato showing uh, responses in the, in the early visual areas during tactile brain reading. There are several experiences. And also our group uh, contributed to show how the whole brain, both functionally and structurally, undergoes a major reorganization that is, a, a, as a tool, at a cortical level. And in this paper, we show also how uh, at a subcortical level we have a, a major rearrangement of information. Nonetheless, uh, our uh, functional brain studies in visually deprived individuals uh, offer this uh, uh, unique tool to examine the role, of visual, uh, the role of the lack of visual experience in forming a representation of the world, and also to understand uh, to what extent vision is a mandatory prerequisite for the human brain to brain and develop. So, to what extent is sight necessary for the brain to develop its morphological and functional architecture? What can we learn by studying blind individuals about how the brain develops and function? Our group has been conducted several studies, and I think that one uh, of the crucial advancement uh, was the demonstration of what we call a supramodal functional cortical organization. And uh, that became from uh, the study of individuals that lost vision early in age, you know, at birth or, or, or immediately uh, at early age. So they had no visual memories, no visual experience. And functional brain studies in these individuals was fundamental to show that the processing of no visual information was not related to what we could refer to a visually based, a visually derived, derived imagery or representation. So the idea was to not just focus in on those brain regions that in the side in the response to a specific content of information conveyed through visual modalities and in the blind through non-visual, but looking at those regions that respond to the specific content of information independently of the sensory modality through which this information is conveyed through the brain. Now, I would like to make clear that uh, 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 for many years we have been like struggling to fight between people supporting the idea of uh, 
brain regions responding independently of sensory experience or the change perspective. Well, we believe that uh, supramodality and cross-modality appears to be two phenomena that, two phenomena that uh, uh, integrate, that are uh, tightly interwoven together and uh, happen at the same time. But just consider supramodal is what takes place despite of the lack of vision, whereas cross-modal is what happens because of the lack of, lack of vision. Now, I would refer to supramodal, but the idea has been expressed uh, towards uh, or through several uh, terminology. Uh, Alvaro Pascal Leon was originally talking about metamodalities. These are almost the same. One is the Latin and one is the Greek root. But uh, the idea is to go beyond a specific sense for modality. Some other groups refer to as polymodality. And now, for example, the uh, Amira Medis group is talking about task specific sensory independent response. They almost mean the same thing. A, rep a representative case to summarize the experimental route that we have been following was obviously starting from uh, what in Jim's lab has been developed and uh, pursued as the object form topology. And so trying to understand how the shape uh, of object, object form, could be recognized through uh, uh, non-visual sensory modalities. So you remember, you know very well our 2004 paper where we asked people to recognize through vision and touch both uh, face masks and uh, or, common man-made objects. And uh, what we show, and was in line with what uh, uh, Amira Mehdi showed a few years before, uh, James Thomas, that uh, a specific overlapping of response here, uh, highlighting in yellow, was present in inferior temporal and ventral temporal extra-striated cortex. The idea, obviously, and the main criticism here was, well, uh, could be just this we do merely to visual imagery. We know that when we ask subjects to imagine, to create a mental image, uh, sighted individuals recall a, a visual base, a visual derived image. Well, the idea to use congenitally blind individuals was to rule out the possibility that this information could be processed uh, through uh, a visual based image. And the idea was that uh, if the same brain activation is present in both sighted for visual and non-visual modalities and in blind individuals for non-visual non modality, well, this information should be processed in a more abstract way, in a supermodal way. This was probably one of the first studies that uh, clearly highlighted this concept. And uh, I recently happened to review in my group uh, studies that were performed both in uh, sighted and blind individuals. And now we got up to more than 50 studies uh, showing and extending what was originally determined for the, mainly the, the ventral visual pathways and the dorsal visual pathways and for different cognitive or perceptual domains ranging from object shape recognition, motion discrimination, tool use, uh, spatial and navigation. And we swiftly extend to other domain of uh, cognition and move to social. And so uh, getting to uh, understand, for example, uh, our study on the uh, uh, let's say, uh, an, a supramodal action observation network, a theory of mind network that Marina Bad show, and some other studies on emotional perspective. So uh, the supramodal nature of, uh, of uh, uh, a specific brain regions, in our opinion, should uh, reflect a shared, more absent representation of the perceived stimuli, which is not depending uniquely on the input from a specific sensory modality. And it's not even dependent from the specific task that is required to uh, process that kind of information or some other stimulus feature like familiarity or localization in space, for instance. Um, very nicely, supramodality has been shown, for instance, uh, uh, when the same stimulus is conveyed through sensory substitution device that uh, process information through non-visual sensory modalities. Uh, in Natalie's, in Natalie's response, these regions nicely respond also uh, through uh, adaptation of response uh, across sensory modalities. And uh, uh, even some groups have been able to use TMS to uh, uh, infer and to impair processing of specific information in these supramodal regions across visual and non-visual modalities. Obviously, in, uh, in uh, collecting this data and interacting with the scientific community, 
there are several questions about this idea, and obviously we, uh, it would be more than a pleasure to discuss together about limitations and which might be the future development. But one of the main aspects is really a question, is this more absolute representation of information truly supermodel? I mean, uh, there is a, a sharing of a common code across sensory modalities. As uh, uh, Michael uh, Beauchamp uh, nicely highlighted in one of his paper attacking one of our previous funding, just kidding, Michael. Uh, it was showing out how, for many years, we have been, we have been defining supramodal regions by a simple uh, contrast, unimodal, uh, unicentric, uh, univariate contrast, defining and isolated visual regions, and then looking at, for example, auditory regions, and then focusing on what is the uh, spatial. Over overlap at a group level. Obviously, this is, there are huge limitations in this kind of definition. But obviously, the, one of the main questions is, what's going to happen at the neural level, neuronal level? You know, we have two voxels that are commonly recruited through different sensory modalities. Do we have a situation like this, having unimodal neurons, each one responding to uh, either uh, visual or non-visual modalities, and just looking at the fMRI for existence resolution, we cannot really assess this kind of discrimination. Or we might have something like this, you know, having a part of the, of, of the neurons that might respond to uh, uh, supramodal to a more absolute representation. Well, looking at the literature, this it's quite uh, animal literature. It's quite amazing how there are really few, few studies that try to address this kind of uh, response. And uh, none of these studies have been uh, seriously performing in uh, uh, congenitally blind animals. But we have a couple of studies that are quite interesting. One is uh, in the late 80s uh, showing, for example, a response, a more absolute response in V4 uh, for uh, uh, tactile discrimination of grading. So a visual, a clearly visual regions that is responding to a very low level visual information like orientation discrimination. And the other well-known example, for instance, is about one-third of neurons in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that are called auditory, audiovisual mirror neurons. Anyhow, some neurons that respond to more absent representation of action goals. So these studies uh, uh, suggest that uh, supramodal properties may be restricted to only part of the whole neuronal population. Uh, and uh, concern representation of different perceptual complexity. How could be that supramodal response ranges from very simple low-level features like orientation and to something that is much more complex like uh, uh, an action goal? So really, this is a question that is still open. With brain imaging techniques, we cannot get to neuronal level, but we can try to Look, as, uh, as uh, Jim Axby and Pietro did in their paper, at, at, at a pattern of response. So looking at the specific content of information here and move from a univariate to a multivariate approach. In that paper, what we did was a very simple comparison and uh, just focusing on the brain regions that show overlap across modality. And in that specific study, by just, just simply correlating the pattern of response uh, between and within categories, we have been showing that the pattern of response elicited during tactile discrimination are category specific. So uh, the pattern of response of man main objects correlates higher uh, than compared to, other, uh, to the other kind, kind of stimulus, and the same for phase. So just showing that the is uh, distinct patterns of response that are distributed across, uh, across the whole ventrotemporal cortex. And the same thing happened when we tried in subject subject to correlate uh, man-made objects and the shape and their shape across sensory modality, I mean, tactile through visual. We were not able to uh, confirm that from the face, but that obviously could be a matter of discussion. Uh, anyhow, the idea here was that these homologies are not limited to the topographical localization of the recruited cortical areas, but mainly involve the content of the neural response. We have been using another study, another data set of ours, the, the one where we were like identified this action, supramodal action observation network. And uh, in this study, we had three conditions related to the visual and auditory representation of uh, action versus non-action stimuli. And uh, 
and we did that both in sighted and obviously for the auditory only in blind individuals. What we used was a simple multivariate machine learning classifier, and within each experimental group and experimental condition, we performed a kind of discrimination, action versus an action. And even if the data set was not collected with this purpose, we obtained a very nice and high uh, classification discrimination uh, across subjects. And what was interesting is that even in different conditions, we were relying on very similar uh, networks. One idea was, well, this is actually not really addressing and finding a common response. So let's try to take uh, all experimental conditions and all experimental groups and try to merge into a single classifier, independently of the, their, uh, the fact they are blind or sighted, independent they are receiving information from uh, through the visual or the, tact or the auditory modality. And very nicely, we have identified a more localized network. And when we limit it to this network, our uh, classification discrimination each uh, classifier that was trained on a specific experimental condition and in specific experimental groups was even able to classify the action and action discrimination with a high accuracy across sensory modality and across the experimental groups. So you could train, uh, for instance, the classifier through visual modalities inside individuals and were able to classify the auditory. So the idea uh, was obviously shared with other groups, but the, the idea was that uh, uh, here we have a truly common overlapping uh, functional representation of action of action goals. So the, the quantum leap of the multivariate approach offered, and to go into a little bit more detailed uh, analysis of the information content, and uh, uh, proved, is proving to be very effective in addressing several questions. Now, without entering specific, one of the main topic of supramodality is to show, uh, for instance, motion discrimination. There are uh, probably 15, 20 studies now trying to address is supramodal, is no supramodal, merging different modalities, different psychophysical aspects, uh, everything. One thing that I would like just to show is uh, uh, recent uh, Julia Dormal and Olivier Collignon uh, contribution just published uh, that show how multivariate analysis could improve motion discrimination when you move from a, a classical univariate approach to a multivariate approach in single subject. And I think that this is one of the uh, line that we have to pursue it in order to improve and to understand which kind of information is truly, uh, is truly conveyed in this, in this neural representation. Several other questions, obviously. And uh, the idea is, uh, is, uh, well, when we start from uh, very simple feature, low-level feature detection, when we perceive a, a stimuli of the, of, the, of the external world, and we merge this information to simple perception, more complex, and go into, let's say, uh, and allow me to use this idea of a conceptual representation. Uh, obviously, uh, the idea is how is this unimodal information uh, or is integrated into uh, a representation that is more abstract? At uh, which level we have this uh, uh, change to supramodality? You know, is here or is a little bit higher? So um, we, we started looking at uh, conceptual knowledge, and uh, the idea was well, if. Uh, 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 if, if conceptual knowledge share a common representation across sensory modalities, would this representation truly independent from the sensory features? As you know, uh, theories about knowledge organization in the human brain propose that concept, maybe described that accordingly to two extreme or uh, uh, to perceptual process or semantic representation. For instance, the uh, modality specifi spe specificity theory suggests that uh, knowledge is, pr is principally modulated by low-level uh, components. Uh, domain specificity is instead looking to a more uh, abstract sensory independent representation of concept. And there are uh, some theories in the middle, uh, like uh, uh, the grounded cognition uh, framework, that claim that probably we have part of the sensory information that could be used uh, to, to go towards uh, a more abstract processing. 
Previous studies, and this is uh, Utanope studies uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, previous use, uh, using univariate method to uh, explore the semantic representation in sighted and blind subjects. And uh, uh, she showed how semantic retrieval was, uh, uh, was uh, relying on a common network, both in sighted and, uh, uh, and blind individuals, left lateralized, involved in frontal, temporal, and parietal uh, activation. But no other information have been provided specifically on how uh, the, 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 the conceptual structure of knowledge organization is represented at neural level on features that could comprise both sensory-based information, high-level semantic feature. So the aim of our study was to investigate whether semantic feature model of concrete nouns, for the moment we limit it just to this aspect, encoded through different sensory modalities in sighted and congenitally blind individuals share common and distributed neural representation. Uh, well, two more questions we try to address. Well, uh, if conceptual knowledge relies on, would rely on a specific sensory base features, would be there a level at which the sensory information advances towards a more absolute representation? And how is this concept organization scaled in the human brain? Uh, are we relying uh, on a small scale, localized, specific representation in anatomically well-defined regions? Or rather, we are counting on uh, larger scale representational patterns of neural activity. We started from uh, data uh, collected in the behavioral experiments where, uh, through a, a simple uh, property generation tasks, we validated a, a wide number of uh, uh, concept abstract names and verbs. And uh, this is the, what is called the blind Italian norming data and are uh, being collected by uh, the, the Department of Linguistics at the University of Pisa uh, that are our collaborators in this, uh, in this study. And what was very nice is that, that uh, analyzing uh, property generation features, uh, uh, congenitally blind people show high behavioral similarities with sight individuals in conceptual representation. Even when they were processing semantic features like color terms or verbal vision that are related, related to visual features. So we designed a similar fMRI experiment. Neural responses were uh, measured in, uh, with a three Tesla fMRI and with a five runs slow event related design in 20 uh, uh, subjects, 15 sided, five blind, congenital blind individuals during a very similar property generation task. And that was done for uh, three different conditions, uh, pictorial visual form, Cited only verbal visual form, and then obviously it's the, same, the opposite, and the uh, verbal auditory form. So, uh, and this is done for blind and sight individuals. So the idea was to try to uh, rely on behavioral data on the linguistic production, and to see whether this linguistic production that is very similar between sighted and congenital blind individuals is actually encoded in the human brain. In our pipeline, we first identified regions retaining categorical information by means of encoding techniques. That's because we were using 40 concrete nouns that uh, uh, belong to uh, eight different categories. So we wanted to address this specific information. And the encoded techniques were very similar to what Tom Mitchell has been developing uh, in the last years. We have been combining these uh, uh, specific responses in each subject in a, probabilist, in a, at a group level probabilistic map. And then we try to segment the whole semantic network uh, in individual regions using two arbitrary thresholds in order to isolate two kind of uh, uh, scaling of uh, network, one uh, comprising uh, localizing small region and one other larger extent of cortex. And what we did was then for each region trying to describe the information contact using the coded techniques that uh, provided information on the classification accuracy of the information provided here and the preference, for instance, for a specific semantic class. 
and also we compare their, their representational spaces with the behavioral data. Looking at behavioral results related to the 40 stimuli uh, and to assess whether they were different between group to, 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 to the two groups, we clearly show that uh, as expected, the 40 stimuli were organized in the eight semantic categories, even behaviorally. And the uh, conceptual representation uh, at a category level between sighted and blind individuals showed to be really high, high correlated, suggesting a common linguistic re representation of distant object categories. A multivoxel pattern analysis was used to define this category-based encoding model, and so we just identified across the sensory modalities. We have five sighted subjects using the pictorial, five using the verb, five using the auditory, and five blind subjects using the auditory verbal form. And we, we merged the whole data together probabilistic since we wanted to isolate the common substrate, the common uh, probabilistic map, and we were able, using the category-based encoding procedure, to discriminate the 40 stimuli across the presentation modality in almost all our subjects. And what was nice was to obtain uh, a, a, a common uh, cortical probability maps that confirm the idea of this left lateralized circuit. At this point, what we did, and just for the for the the, 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 the sake of of, of clarity, uh, using uh, the, the, the encoding procedure reached accuracy that were quite overlapping with what Tom Mitchell and his collaborators have been showing in years using also different uh, methods of feature extracting. We reached about 75-77% of accuracy for the pictorial and about 65% of accuracy discrimination for the other condition. What we did is uh, was trying to segment the probability map at two levels. One was to define a small-scale localized representation that was able to isolate uh, specific regions uh, that were common at least in 10 participants across experimental conditions. And as you know, there was nice regions showing left inferior parietal, left uh, lateral occipital, uh, bilateral uh, angular gyros, and retrosprenial bilateral and parahippocampal regions. And also, we define a large-scale distributed representation, so brain regions locks are responding at least in five people, and we find a wider distributed with a, a, a larger posterior semantic network and a anterior semantic network, mainly localized in the left hemisphere. What we did was to analyze the content of information. Let me just briefly go through into some more detail. Well, here you can see the, the four conditions, sighted pictorial, sighted verbal, auditory, and blind auditory. And here is the correlation with the behavioral data, so using representational similarity analysis and comparing uh, the encoding information in each subject with the linguistic production. And here we have correlation of the neural response across conditions. What is nice is, for example, showing that we, if we select two primary, early primary regions like D1 and A1, we found no category information in these regions. So this was mostly used as control condition. There are some regions, like for example, the right angular gyros or the retrospinal cortex that appear to correlate just in sighted individuals or across condition inside with inside individuals. So uh, here we have a, a category representation that is strongly visually based. Other regions, like the parahippocampal and the inferior parietal cortex, instead show a more abstract representation that is shared across modality, across groups, and even show a higher correlation with the behavioral linguistic production. What is interesting, for instance, we have also a specific response in lateral occipital where uh, the, the pictorial aspects of sight it correlates with the auditory processing in blind. And this is very interesting because it appears like that uh, uh, hello lateral occipital is a matter of debate of what it's really processing. But the idea here, it looks like that uh, is processing, allow me to say, more shape than uh, uh, identity because uh, uh, shape uh, representation 
also in blind, done through visual, mod through auditory modality, appears to be, let's say, in a, in a visual form. But what is nice is that, uh, if we can summarize, it, it, that, that at this small scale representation, uh, we confirm the idea of a left lateralized semantic network, but we identified various levels of discrimination accuracy and common discrete knowledge uh, representation. Moreover, we study also representation of single stimulus categories, and uh, we found that some regions show clear preference. You know, this, for instance, in the retrosplanar cortex, where we know is very well represented spatial layout, or for example, in, a, in a inferior parietal, where uh, many people, uh, affordable objects have been preferentially uh, processed. And this is very nice because we can translate that to a neuropsychological perspective then, and this data support the idea that uh, localized regions could uh, uh, cause a specific, uh, uh, category-specific uh, behavioral impairment. When we move to a large-scale representation, uh, we notice that uh, a wider bilateral network is, uh, 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 is uh, um, engaged. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, all this representation appears to become more abstract and shared across experimental conditions and highly correlate with the linguistic production. So it appears to be closer. And what is very interesting is that uh, category, uh, even if this high level of discrimination accuracy uh, and common knowledge representation are present in larger uh, network, uh, this network do not appear to show a preference for semantic categories. This could be confirmed also using some other very nice tricks now to with multidimensional scaling, for example, in this uh, uh, posterior semantic area, and show you very nicely how the behavioral data collapse across blind and sight individuals in a specific category. So it appears like the conceptual knowledge in the human brain relies on this distributed and modality independent cortical representation that appears to integrate the, per the partial category and modality specific information that are retained at a very speciali specialized regional level. If thus I have to get to summarize uh, the findings of our last study, well, uh, the overall category-based organization of conceptual knowledge did, did, did not differ across presentation modalities or between sighted and blind individuals. And that's a very strong point. Regional difference within patterns of neural activity across modality and between, and between groups were observed only when limited to functionally localized small defi defined regions. On the contrary, patterns of neural activity within a wider semantic cortical network appear to be independent from both the sensory modality of stimuli, stimuli presentation and visual experience. And moreover, these patterns, these distributed patterns, were much closer to the linguistic production. So we propose that uh, uh, large-scale neural representation might be an effective model to explain uh, how the human brain processes semantic information and how conceptual knowledge emerges in a more absent way. So uh, the integration of information content uh, across a larger extent of cortex appears to be to generate a unique modality independent internal representation that matches with the behavioral data and retains, appear to retain a more defined definition of concepts. In contrast, when we look at a small scale representation, limited regions, we found uh, category preferentially. And again, we retain modality dependent structure, so information, features that come from the sensory modality to which we acquire knowledge. And this two distinct level of semantic process, processing may explain how information progresses, advances from a sensory based towards a more abstract concept or representation. And uh, in this framework, both the domain and modality-specific theories may actually coexist. 
And obviously, we, 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 we propose that the different threshold of observation is what actually uh, changes the degree, the degree to which we observe this kind of process. So if I can conclude this talk, uh, we st strongly believe that uh, uh, there are brain regions in the brain that process external, inf uh, process external information, sensory information, regardless of the sensory modality through which this information has been acquired. Uh, unisensory information should be somehow processed retain some kind of information, but then process to a more abstract representation. So could we think of a supramodal mechanism, of a supramodal continuum that ranges from low-level feature to higher concept? Well, before getting to the last questions, is I would like to say that uh, the idea that we have a more abstract representation obviously explain uh, how blind individuals individuals that lack vision since birth could acquire knowledge and interact effectively with, an, with external world they've never seen. And their brain is not actually disabled, but really differentially able and share the same kind of neural representation that the sighted brain has. An idea also is that uh, the lack of visual experience uh, hardly affects than the functional uh, development of brain organization. So obviously, in the, in the next years, uh, we will have to understand better how this process has, could be uh, developed. Uh, there are some kind of genetic, let's say, uh, definition that uh, allows some brain regions to specifically respond to some psychophysical information provided through different or across different sensory modalities, and how this information is really processed then to a more abstract uh, level of, uh, of representation. Well, I would like to thank you again, my fellow that really did most of the work, and uh, all our collaborators across Italy and across uh, Europe and the, whole, and the whole world, and uh, just would like to thank you for your attention. Ciao Emiliano, thank Ciao, you very much for your very beautiful presentation. I'm particularly grateful for your definition of uh, the supramodal concept of actions in which I strongly, strongly believe. Um, however, I could just uh, uh, push you towards another way around to, to look at the problem. Uh, I mean, you asked, uh, and you are going to uh, to see which are the evidences uh, on this integration of uh, sensory modalities, uh, um, and at which level they uh, this integration occur. Uh, however, uh, there are a lot of uh, indications that in fetuses and in newborns. Um, there is the, a, a synesthesia, which uh, um, comprehend also the, the, the motor uh, correlation. So the sensory motor uh, representation is uh, synesthetic. And uh, that uh, the first uh, period of life uh, is um, uh, the, the, the newborn has the goal to uh, in some sense, differentiate uh, modalities. And this may be in order to be much more able to deeply focus attention towards uh, <clears throat> specific stimuli. So the, the presence of uh, synesthetic perception uh, is, uh, is present in everybody, even in not really synesthetic people. So. I would like to know what you think about this, if it could be another way around to see the question. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Well, um, 
I will try to uh, reply on a more general base. I'm not, not, not an expert on synesthesia. And uh, I know that there are several studies that uh, have been highlighted, for instance, uh, uh, let's say, abnormal kind of connection across uh, sensory brain areas. But uh, I don't think that uh, what you claim is some kind in opposition with, uh, with what we are uh, somehow highlighting. Uh, we do believe that uh, sensory motor ex experience is necessary in order to uh, form some kind of uh, representation. So we, it's not that we are supporting sort of like a, a model, if, if, if you want to call it that way, kind of representation. Um, I think that, that uh, what the blind brain has been offering these last years uh, is uh, to understand how sensory information uh, is also shared across different sensory modalities, and uh, com not, not just commonly, but also specifically through, uh, in each sensory modality. This part is much more related to the cross-modal plasticity framework that we hardly uh, analyze, but that has been showing uh, how uh, the information at a certain points gets to the occipital cortex information pro provided through different sensory modalities. Could it be motor, could it be uh, tactile, could it be uh, auditory? Now, uh, say there are uh, tons of papers on uh, uh, cross-modal plasticity still investigating and still trying to address how much uh, is uh, functionally specific, uh, which are the uh, neuronal processing related to a sort of like a masking or related to a sort of like rerouting or potentiating uh, direct heteromodal connection to primary sensory areas. But this is not really a field where I I'm, I'm actually uh, would like to focus. I, I don't think that synesthesia is somehow uh, going against what, what, what you're finding. Uh, we have been, uh, from a linguistic viewpoint, we have been acquiring very preliminary data in blind individuals. And what is nice is that uh, uh, I, I couldn't tell you more because we, it, it was really uh, uh, preliminary acquisition of data, but it's nice that uh, even when you refer to visual attributes, like for example, transparent, uh, that uh, you, can, you, you can refer in a more abstract way, like uh, you know, uh, this uh, is a transparent concept, for instance. Well, for instance, for uh, uh, some blind individuals, congenital blind individuals that have no idea of what transparency could, could be, associate or try to associate that with smoothness. So define the concept of transparency that is visual as smooth, something like that. So I think that that's something that should be a little bit more investigated. But uh, I fully agree that uh, a sensory motor experience is necessary. We can then question what's going to happen uh, without any sensory experience. But this, I think, is a matter that uh, probably will remain a philosophical question, because I don't think that in reality we might have uh, uh, individuals with no sensory experience. Thank you, Emiliani, for a beautiful talk. Uh, if I may try and push the model of the supramodal organization slightly backwards, what would you guess backwards in uh, posterior visual cortex, that is? Uh, in posterior, what, sorry? In posterior visual cortex. Okay. Uh, what would your guess be as to the regions that uh, do not typically show uh, more abstract supramodal organization, that do not show category selectivities, that do not show these... Um, non-visual properties also incited, what would you guess that they do in the blind? And what would you try to assume their non-visual roles would be? Would they be uh, more related to the original visual computation or to some sort of more cross-model sort of plasticity? Uh, I, I know this is, uh, <laughs> this is a kind of... Uh, well, um, I know that... that uh, there's, we are starting having pieces of evidence that uh, what we could call the early sensory regions do process specific psychophysical aspects, features of stimuli. And uh, I'm just thinking, for instance, a last year paper published by 
street amid in showing retinotopic organization in uh, or retinotopic like organization in in blind or uh, I know, I know, I know, I know, but that, 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 I know this function continues, but I don't think that that, that that would change the kind of, it, there are different ways to look at, at the same thing, but I don't think that, that the, 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 the idea behind that is different. Uh, or I think, for example, I just review it, uh, an abstract, I don't know if you can tell, but now it's, it's online on, uh, um, on a 70 study just submitted at a, at a at a next human brain mapping meeting, showing finger representation in lateral occipital cortex. I mean, during tactile recognition in blind individuals. So I think that uh, uh, early areas, some early areas should process uh, some psychophysical aspects of information independently of the information, or how the information is conveyed. And that is what, for instance, uh, uh, also Alvaro Pascaleon was proposing, you know, that there are areas that are somehow responding for their intrinsic properties to, to spatiotemporal features, let's say, of stimuli and responding to specific uh, aspects. Uh, I'm not then an expert, uh, say, you know, um, I uh, hardly entered the cross-model uh, responses in blind individuals. And uh, I know that there are several studies uh, that ranges from uh, uh, groups uh, supporting the idea that, uh, that early sensory areas like visual cortex is actually processing very localized and specific information like the word for area or the number area and some other that support the idea that uh, responses in the occipital cortex are totally aspecific, okay? So they ju ju just respond into some kind of cognitive load or content, but no specific information. And now I think that uh, we have several pieces of evidence that some kind of specificity do actually exist in these uh, cross-model responses. Uh, we still do need to understand uh, the neuronal aspects that subtend these, these, these elements. I think that uh, one thing that, uh, if you think of the many, many studies that have been done in uh, blind animals, and uh, they are mostly being done in order to pursue it, uh, just what cross-model plasticity, when, how occur, but none of them is actually looking, uh, which are the common uh, response that survive or do exist independently uh, of, of, of a sensory experience. And this uh, uh, observation should range from the genetic uh, aspects. You know, are, are some genes expressed independently of sensory experience and then go further to higher level of observation? I know that I was going to <laughs> provoke some cross model guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thank you, Just thanks a lot, here. Emiliana. We have, we have already discussed about that, but uh, I'm still curious to, to, to hear you speaking about um, this point. So you explained very well that how it started, right? So you observe like some kind of, mm, in the occipital cortex of sighted people, non-visual activity. And so it could be visual imagery. So let's take the congitally blind, they could not rely on visual imagery. And if they have it, it proves it's not visual imagery, and then it's maybe supramodal. And I think it's slightly misleading, like as you, as you know, I believe, because the point is that this overlapping of activity or even this overlapping of multivariate pattern things like the fact that a ball in LO is closer to the moon than to any kind of other object could still be in the blind and in the sighted subject like this, but not being at all supramodal, right? So it could be encoded tactily in the blind and visually in the sighted, so the representation of this stimulation will be relatively similar, but the format of the representation will be very different. And my prediction then will be that if you do a lesion of this region, you only impair visual processing in the sighted, but tactile processing in the blind. So again, that would not go along the idea of supramodality. Yeah. Um... I, I disagree, as you know. Uh, in our 2004 paper, we, uh, we have been, there is a piece of discussion that, that we had that, that aspect, you know. We cannot exclude that uh, uh, in our observation, a sighted subject could rely on, on visual imagery and uh, blind individuals could, could rely on different tactile imagery. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, there are two aspects to be considered. One, now we are collecting several pieces of evidence, and uh, when you uh, use multivariate uh, technique to 
uh, train from visual modalities and you're able to classify uh, the auditory modality in the blind, that means that some commonalities uh, do exist. So uh, it could be related to, uh, obviously the, there might be limitation in the spatial aspects, in the uh, averaging, in the thresholding, obviously, but I think that's the line, you know, uh, we are collecting evidences, pieces of evidence now that uh, there is a common coding behind that. And also what I think in this last study is very interesting is that uh, we provide uh, the idea that uh, uh, the sensory specific features that are processed uh, do actually count when you focus on a specific aspects and uh, uh, they become more abstract when you go to a larger network. We cannot exclude that what we are observing in small localized regions could be uh, truly sensory based. So as, as you are claiming, it might be different from, uh, from sighted to, to, to blind. But what we are uh, the idea is that when we get to a higher, to a larger network, that, that sensory base specificity should disappear. There are some TMS studies. One is the one that we did, for example, in the anterior part of TMS, and we showed that mo speed discrimination of motion, of tactile motion, is impaired in sighted individuals. So we actually show, and probably we would need more studies uh, 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 pursuing that aspect. Uh, one thing is that uh, and probably I, I we, 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 you know, people working in the blind brain uh, hardly focus on, and I always uh, appreciate your work, Olivier, because uh, you pay, always paid a lot of attention in the uh, psychophysical structure and selection of stimuli. And that's something that I always claim with you. Uh, let's, we have to be sure that we are comparing the same thing. And well, if you're talking about motion, I do believe that changing the psychophysical aspects of motion information, optical, tactile, or auditory, we are providing different information. So just an example, we have been working with tactile flow, with tactile motion, and if you go to a circular, for example, expansion of the surface of contact, you're not providing as in visual auditory movement back forward, but you're providing information on the soft and hardness of what you're touching, so it's a totally different information. And uh, related to MT, you know, I agree with Michael when he claims that there are several other regions rare, there when you average. It's something that I've wrote as a reviewer in your paper. You should look and look probably at individual and individual subjects, and you did, and your, sub, and your results improved. That's, that's, that's something that obviously uh, has, to be, has to be highlighted. You know, when, when, you, when you claim that, uh, that, uh, that motion discrimination could not be shared, you cannot then use like a brush on a harm in order to, to, to offer me an idea of tactile motion. I don't think that that's, that's, that's purely uh, uh, the same information. Same kind of discussion is, uh, for example, in lateral occipital cortex. What we are, we are, we are comparing, uh, there are Mario's paper on, uh, on uh, object, uh, object representation, and the idea is are, are we collecting information of, on uh, uh, shape object form or identity, and that's, that's a very important aspect. Because when we, we the first study, Amir Amadi did, uh, James Thomas, we were trying to, uh, to recognize the shape, both visually and tactilely, and then we offered the sound of that object through auditory, but we found no specific recruitment of LOC, but just because the sound, when I hear the, the whistle of a train or some other kind of sign, sound, I'm recognizing the identity of that object, not the shape. So when you go and compare also in sighted, but even worse with blind, you don't have the specifically the shape of that. So that, that's, some, some, that's something that has to be uh, better understood, you know, which kind of information. You know, I remember uh, Melvin papers on texture discrimination, that part of, of, of area of, of the kind of material. That's other kind of information that we do need to explore. But I disagree, you know, I think that there is a common code in a certain level. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, it, 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 various points you were making, um, the comment how uh, surprising it was that the blind seemed to have a similar conceptual representation or structure to uh, the sighted. 
And you know, that's not surprising, it shouldn't be surprising. Um, they are normal people, they write novels, uh, beautiful novels. Uh, some of them are painters like you showed, and they're beautiful. And um, uh, so, so I agree with you, there, there should be no reason to be surprised, but, but they are surprising things. So, um, there should be things that we should think about hard. So, and some of you have worked on this, so you have more, more ideas. I, I don't have any ideas on this. Um, but there's a difference between uh, knowing what red is and the qualia red. And uh, the blind person knows what red is, knows it in some sense, perhaps slightly different from the way we know what red is, people who can see. Uh, but they know what red is, you get the color uh, uh, wheel, they, if they're painters, they know what to paint and how to relate them to each other, so they're amazingly knowledgeable of what color is, but they don't experience color and they don't have the sense of color that, that you and I have. So, so the question is, uh, or is the representation when you go detail, I mean, when you stay very general and the correlations look like 0.6 and 0.5, no idea what they mean. Uh, if you get very detailed and you look at, say, something specific like color, red, is the representation of red in the blind the same as it is in the sighted? That is, where is it the same or where is it different? So what does it say about the levels of representation you're talking about? And all of this talk about cross-modal, a-modal, sub-modal, uh, Transmodal. I mean, I mean, there are many models we can have, and, and it's not clear to me what each one of those means. Uh, well, as you correctly pointed out, you know, there are several of us, uh, of us uh, working on, on this, and probably we have data, uh, we are acquiring data at the same time about, about this aspect. So the, the, the observation that we had is, is just limited to concrete nouns. What I can tell you is that uh, Blind, blind people generally get, uh, get upset when you ask them about uh, color. I, 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 I wanted to specifically take a, a, an, a type of information for which there is no sensory information, whatever. So no, no, that's no. the important uh, point. I, I, I understand what you mean, but, I, but you know, I really have no answer to that because uh, it's something that we obviously we should move to, from concrete and then go to uh, concrete aspects that uh, uh, highlight better those visual features that, uh, because if you, go, if you analyze, now I didn't enter into detail, but if you look at the linguistic production and you ask them, for example, uh, banana, okay? So they're telling you, uh, sighted subject generally is a fruit, obviously, uh, is a yellow, uh, it's the shape of a crescent and you can eat it. The blind subjects are telling you uh, it's a fruit, so obviously at a, at a categorical level they are common, but then they tell you uh, as the shape of a crescent, you eat that, and I know that this is yellow, that the banana is yellow. So, as you were claiming, the, the concept of color, and they use color properly, but I don't think that they actually have any, any specific sensory. Some aspects could be related to synesthesia, so they try to uh, probably some of them, I know, that provides a, a, a thermal uh, or, or temperature correlates of colors, but uh, I, I really cannot answer to your question. This is one, a matter of investigation, a topic of investigation that relates to two aspects. One is related to the ab abstract nouns, so how, how, uh, how uh, blind individuals do represent a con a abstract concept. And the other thing is how uh, those items where the visual features are uh, deeper, are stronger, uh, are really changed uh, uh, in blind beliefs. I cannot answer to your question at this moment. <laughs> well, <Hello. laughs> yeah, you wrote me to ask a question I was thinking about for much of the second half of your talk, um, and it's maybe more of a comment than a question, but it, it maybe is an answer to your question. Um, and it relates to the chaos talk that I gave, I think, at the second uh, um, meeting um, here in Rovereto, uh, where we looked at um, comparisons of congenitally blind and sighted uh, individuals with regard to their representation of colored stimuli, namely fruits and vegetables. Um, and so what we showed is that, just as you said, if we, we selected congenitally blind people who did know the colors. They could stipulate the colors, that a banana was yellow, uh, that a, a strawberry was red. Yeah. Um, but when we took a different measure, and this is really going to be my question slash comment, a different measure of their semantic representation, namely we constructed a similarity space from 
uh, similarity judgments that they made, we saw that the color of the stimuli didn't actually structure their similarity space. So what we argued in that paper was there was a difference between being able to stipulate that a banana is yellow and a strawberry is red versus using that information as part of constructing our conceptual space. Um, so that's a partial answer perhaps to your question about the, the difference between saying something and, and know, knowing it. Um, so my comment slash question for you is, you know, you, the, the conclusions that any of us make are obviously based on how we choose to probe them. Um, and the particular feature listing task you use may tap into a particular aspect of our semantic knowledge that might then steer your data to you know, finding that part of the semantic space. Um, but a different kind of probe might come up with something totally different. So I'm, I'm wondering to what extent you think that that's uh, a, a problem or a feature of your, of your particular findings that you use the task that you used? Uh, obviously, I think that uh, there, there might be a limitation related to the specific task you, you've been using. But uh, we have been trying, uh, starting from the, 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 the behavioral data, the linguistic production, to analyze uh, uh, through different ways of extracting features. And what we found, at least with that specific data set, is a higher commonality. So just, just to tell you, if you go uh, with, with some kind of feature structure, when you go into to be more details of the, of the semantic representation with about 800 uh, features, so matrix, or you go to eight uh, correlation between subjects just changing from 0 0.94 to 0 0.96. So it's really, you know, with the data that we have, we are not able to dissect. One aspect that might be of interest is to focus on those specific categories, like, for example, affordable objects, like uh, fruit, for instance, and to try to go to, to a sort of like a, a within class discrimination. That's something. So uh, as soon as you're going to try to isolate a single item, I think you could highlight like those different in concept or representation that you're not able when you look at a category because categories are clearly overlapping. Thank you. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Uh, now we have a break. Please come back uh, sharply at, uh, um, at, at, at 11.15. Uh, and also we have uh, a poster session, so please go see the posters. Thank you.